southern Norway lies in much the same latitude as the northernmost part of Britain. Lerwick in the Shetland Isles is on nearly the same parallel as Bergen and Oslo. In the west, the mountains form a barrier running north to south, dividing the region into maritime west and continental east. Here, glaciers still persist. The Ostadalsbrain Glacier, 6,000 feet above sea level, is the largest in Norway. Here it is, seen from the air. The glacier ice is covered by snow. This valley, typical of glacial valleys, has been shaped over many centuries by slow movements of the ice. The high mountains form a climatic barrier. To the west, the rainfall is heavy, the temperatures equable. To the east, rainfall is light, with a much greater range of temperature. On the western side of the mountain barrier, there is a typical drowned coast deeply indented by steep-sided inlets called fjords. The largest fjord in Norway is Sogne Fjord, lying between the towns of Ålesund and Bergen. From the air, we can see the pattern of the coastline, with many islands which often shelter the entrance to a fjord. This is Sogne Fjord. Long ago, a glacier carved this inlet. The steep sides come right down into deep water, there is little lowland for cultivation or settlement. From sea level, we see these steep sides more clearly. In places, bare mountains rise 2,000 feet almost sheer from the sea with dramatic waterfalls. Here is the coastline again seen from the air. The numerous islands are of all sizes. These are much flatter than the mainland and offer more scope for settlement and agriculture. On this island, you can see tiny farming villages in the sheltered parts of the coast. The people are often both farmers and fishermen. The breakwater around this little harbour is built to protect the fishing vessels from Atlantic gales. As we come closer, we can see a typical village with houses built facing the sea. We now move to Ålesund, an important fishing port. In January and February, the herring season begins. Vessels from all along the west coast gather here, and the little town is suddenly invaded by 20,000 people. The shoals of herring are located, and the drifters set out. The net is shot from two boats and hangs like a curtain in the sea. These small boats are called dories. You can see the floats which support the top of the net. When ready, the net is hauled in to the side of a large drifter. Here we see it from above laden with fish. It is emptied onto the deck and from there into the hold. If the catch is heavy, another vessel is moved alongside and also loaded with herring. When the boats are full, they return to port. Whales follow the shoals of herring. Whaling vessels are equipped with harpoon guns in the bows. As the whale rises to the surface to breathe, the captive harpoon is shot. It carries an explosive charge which kills the whale. As it is hauled in, a second whale rises.
Whale meat is sold fresh for food or canned to make cat and dog meat. The fat is a valuable source of edible oil. Line fishing for cod is another important Norwegian industry. The lines are nearly a mile long with about 1,500 baited hooks. Here a line is being hauled in and the fish gaffed to make sure they don't escape. Cod are dried in the open air. In the Lofoten Islands, they used latticed stands. But elsewhere, the fish, split and cleaned, are spread out on the flat cliffs to dry. Dried cod is exported from Norway to countries in the Mediterranean region. In places, we find small farmsteads on the sides of the fjords. They cling closely to the rock face, with roofs sloping outwards, so the winter avalanches will rush over without damaging the buildings. On the east side of the mountains, there is high table land with undulating slopes. Further south and east are valleys and many rivers running mainly north to south. There are also numerous finger-like lakes. The largest is Lake Mursa. In the southeast, we find fertile lowlands. Here too is the capital, Oslo, at the head of the fjord, which is its access to the sea. If we go back to the mountain barrier and move east, we can see the tablelands and valleys of eastern Norway. The high mountains shield the east from the strong Atlantic winds. As contrasted with the oceanic climate of the western side, the climate of eastern Norway is continental in type. The mountain barrier to wind and rain is favorable to husbandry. Every year, the farmers take their cattle up to the summer pastures in the mountain plateaus. The tableland is vast and provides good feeding ground for large numbers of animals. Dairy farming is the principal industry. Milking is done by hand, and the milk, except what is kept for home consumption, is sent away to the dairies in the valleys. Here, seen from the air, are the fertile lowlands of southeastern Norway. In the distance is Lake Mjøsa. The area around and to the south of this lake is the richest farming region in Norway. There are no very big farms. Farming is a family affair with all the family working on the land. You can see here the patchwork of mixed subsistence farming. The lighter patches are fields of ripening corn crops. This patchwork appearance is typical. This closer view gives some idea of the size of the holdings. The most important crops are potatoes and cereals. The corn crop most suited to northern conditions is rye. The drier climate of eastern Norway favours cereal crops. This scene might be in East Anglia. In Norway, as in England, agriculture has been considerably mechanised in recent years. In this region, farming is often combined with forestry. Forests cover approximately one quarter of the country. 70% of the forests are conifers, pines and firs. Trees are felled in winter. 
and small power-driven saws cut the timber into suitable lengths. These tractors and sledges are used to haul the logs to a river bank where they are stacked to await the spring thaw. Rivers offer the cheapest and simplest transport system. As soon as the snows begin to melt from the mountains, the timber is thrown in the river. Rafting is carried on under the supervision of a foreman who acts like a general deploying his troops. His men are ordered to different parts of the stream to set the logs in motion and to ensure that they keep moving. The rivers which carry the timber are also used to generate hydroelectric power. But the falls and rapids, which provide sites for power stations, make the movement of timber difficult. To overcome this, rafting canals are built to bypass the falls. Here is one. Underneath it are the pipes conveying the water to the power station. In the lower reaches of the river and in the lakes, the logs are made up into enormous rafting dams. These dams may consist of a hundred thousand tree trunks. As the timber is moved downstream only in a short season each year, large stocks are needed to keep the factories working all the time. The power for the factories comes from the hydroelectric station. The timber is hauled out of the water and into the factory as it is needed. Here is one such factory which uses the timber for furniture making. The tools and machines are all powered by electricity, as throughout Norway. Between West and East Norway, there are only four mountain passes for roads and railways. The most important of these carries the Bergen-Oslo Railway. In wintertime, this is kept open only with great difficulty and constant work. Snowsheds give shelter to the trains at intervals, and various types of snow plough are used to clear the snow from the track. Roads through the passes are closed in winter, and communication between west and east is either by rail, in scenes like this, or round the coast by sea. Oslo, the capital, is a city of 300,000 inhabitants. It is a port with access to the sea through Oslo Fjord. It has many places of historical interest and fine civic buildings. Norway has a long tradition of seamanship. Today, Norway is the fifth maritime power, and her mercantile marine sails and trades all over the world. 